Good morning. Happy Father's Day for the 700th time today. And then I'm going to preach about it a little bit too. But before we do, uh, Pentecost Sunday was a couple weeks ago. And I challenged you to, to give. We took a, a special collection for planting churches with the Timothy Initiative. And you remember because you gave incredibly. In the month of June, over $18,000 came in to plant churches. Come on. That is over 60 churches that are being planted in places that have never heard the name of Jesus, and more came in this week and didn't get included in the count. So thank you so much for your faithful giving. Like we said, 100% of that is going right to TTI, and we're, we're super excited about that because we're, we're bringing about the kingdom of God. We're advancing the kingdom of God, and you did that. You were a part of that. And the economy's not great right now, and you gave anyway. And I believe that God is going to honor you for that, and that is just, that is incredible. That made my night. That was my Father's Day gift. So I heard that last night, and I was just overjoyed. So over $18,000, we are, we are so blessed. So church, thank you. Thank you for your faithful giving and for promoting the work of the Lord. So this morning, Father's Day, Got to tip my hat to the men who are out there and who are doing it right and doing it well, living for Jesus, faithful in their marriages, raising godly children, providing for their families, used to be more common. It used to be kind of like that was the, the standard, but really it's more of an outlier today. It's almost the exception to the rule. And we know in, in recent years, our culture has demonized men. Ward Cleaver and Mike Brady, not Tom Brady, Mike, Brady Bunch, focus. They've been replaced by Homer Simpson, <laughs> Peter Griffin, not, not a great comparison. Uh, we've learned about toxic masculinity, which is kind of men aren't allowed to be manly. And I know that's not the definition, but... Everything about manhood is kind of under assault. And what do we see in our time today? Men are confused. Uh, people who are victims are, are promoted. And don't even get me started on man buns. That's not in my notes. I'm, maybe it should be. I don't know. I think we have a couple man bun second services. But, but I'm still saying it. I don't care. So, uh, and, and I think this whole, this whole concept has affected the church as well. Somewhere along the line, serving Jesus got, and I don't think this is the word, sissified. It, it got feminine. It got different uh, from the worship to the leadership to the style. And I know many men were turned off. They avoided the faith. I want you to know this morning, that is not the faith of the Bible. That is not what we see in Scripture. We forget that our Savior was a carpenter. He worked with his hands in a day when there were no power tools. He emptied out a temple with a whip in his words and tossed a few tables in the process. He stood strong among many critics. He showed courage in the face of his most powerful enemies. But it wasn't just Jesus who stood out. In scripture, we read about men of God who slayed giants, who conquered pharaohs, who toppled kings and kingdoms. So today for Father's Day, I want to look at a biblical character who showed some serious, serious manly qualities. And we're going to talk this morning about what it means to be a man of God. Now, don't worry, ladies, there's something here for you as well. Uh, because this is what you should want for your husband. Single ladies, this is what you should be looking for in a husband. Young men, this is what you should aspire to. Grandma, grandpa, this is how you should be encouraging your grandsons, your granddaughters. So we got you all covered this morning, okay? Today we're going to look at the 10th king of Israel. You know the 10th king of Israel? It's literally on the screen. I figured you would have guessed. I figured you would have flaunted your biblical knowledge and been like, I don't know, uh, Jehu? Yeah, okay, there you go. 10th uh, king of Israel, and he is a bad dude. Not bad in a bad way, like Bad in a wow, cool, 
look what he did kind of way. And this is a manly sermon, okay? This is, we're going to cover some stuff today because Jehu did some stuff for the Lord. We first hear about him in 1 Kings chapter 19. The prophet Elijah, maybe the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, just has a showdown on Mount Carmel. And after this, despite the victory, he, he felt discouraged because he felt like he was all alone. And the Lord speaks to Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15. We'll put it on the screen. This is what the Lord says. So go and return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as a prophet in your place. Look at verse 17. And it shall be whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Spoiler alert, Jehu didn't miss many. Je Jehu did his job effectively. Who is this guy? King Ahab is the most wicked king in the Old Testament. It says in 1 Kings 16.30 that Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any other king before him. Now, if you've read through the book of Kings or you're familiar with the story, they're almost all terrible kings. There's a civil war. Israel is divided into Israel and Judah, northern, southern kingdom. Most of the kings on both sides were bad. They were all involved in idolatry. There's a few that stand out as good kings and reformers, but overwhelmingly, they were all bad kings. They all welcomed and brought idolatry into Israel. And it says of Ahab, he was worse than any of the others before him. He was a bad king. And he took as his wife Jezebel, who was a bad queen. Together, they totally corrupted the kingdom they brought in all forms of idolatry and Baal worship and harlotries and you name it, it was awful. And Ahab and Jezebel, their reign together was a part of the problem. Jehu was a former commander in Ahab's army. Jehu was one of the men who went out for Ahab and he helped him carry out these atrocities against Israel. But something happens here. Something happens in Jehu. God gets a hold of him, and God does a work in him, and where originally this man just really led the charge of evil, now God was going to use him to do his work. Jehu's story, there's a little bit of a redemption story in there. He went from working, high ranking, for the worst king in Israel's history to serving the king of kings and the lord of lords. And before we even get into what he accomplished, that's such a good message for some of us today. Because it doesn't matter how far you've gone away. God can use you. Come on. It doesn't matter what the past looked like. It doesn't matter if you got some, some, some marks on your record. God can use anyone. And this Jehu story is a great story of a man who was so far away, yet God brought him near and used him for his purposes. I want you to know this morning, men, you're not too far gone. Your marriage isn't too far gone. Your kids aren't too far gone. Your faith isn't too far gone. You are not too far gone to receive a miracle from Almighty God for God to use you. I love Jehu's story because th there's a little bit of a redemption story in here with it. So he had a clear call from God. He was a reformer and God was going to use him to clean up someone else's mess. 
And there's not a dad in here today who doesn't know what it's like to have to clean up someone else's mess. All the men, give me an amen on that one. Come on. 2 Kings chapter 9. Elijah anoints Jehu as king. And Jehu's first order of business is to deal with a couple of people who self-appointed themselves as king after Ahab's death. They're like, oh, I'll be king now because, you know, my dad's out. Two of them specifically, one was Joram, he was the king of Israel, then another Ahaziah, the king of Judah. So we read in 2 Kings chapter 9 that Jehu jumps in a chariot and makes his way to see Joram and Ahaziah. And he's going to deliver on what God called them to do. And I don't have the verse here on the screen, but they recognize him coming. And the verse says, because the man driving the chariot drives furiously. It must be Jehu. He was identified for his furious driving. I don't know who that's for this morning. I want you to know God sees you and he loves you still, okay? So driving furiously, he's going after Joram. Verse 22, now it happened when Joram saw Jehu that he says, is it peace, Jehu, or, or do you come in peace? So he answered, what peace as long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many. He went straight to mother talk. He went right after his mother. Your mama's so, okay. So Jehu immediately said, there will be no peace as long as this continues, which your mother brought about. And Joram turned around and fled. And he said to Ahaziah, treachery, Ahaziah. Now Jehu, verse 24, drew his bow with full strength. Mm. And he shot Joram between his arms and the arrow came out at his heart and he sank down in his chariots. And a few verses later, Ahaziah succumbs to the same fate. That's a manly story right there. <laughs> Jehu pulls out his bow, full strength, takes out these enemies of God. Next, Jehu goes on to deal with Jezebel, who's still alive. Verse 30 says, when Jehu had come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through a window. She put on makeup like she was going to seduce him, like she was going to impress him with her, her looks. And in verse 31, as Jehu entered the gate of the city, she said, is it peace, Zimri, murderer of your master? Zimri, hmm. Now that should catch you off guard because, well, that's not his name, <laughs> all right? His name is Jehu. Who's Zimri? Why is she mentioning Zimri? 1 Kings 16 tells us about Zimri. He was king for a week before he was murdered. Jezebel, taunting him from the window, calls him by another name, saying, your fate will be the same as his. Your treachery, your, your turning your back on King Ahab, that's going to come back on you just like it did to Zimri. Verse 32, he looked up at the window and he said, who is on my side? Who? Who? And two or three of the eunuchs, two or three of the queen's attendants looked out at him. And he said, and throw her down. They threw her out the window. Some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. They're not doing this story in children's church today. <laughs> nope. Throw her out the window. After they threw her out, he rides over her on her horse and kills her. And the next verse is even better. Verse 34, and then he went in and ate and drank. <laughs> this is a bad dude. Th this is a bad guy. Jehu still wasn't finished. In chapter 10, he goes, he finds 70 of Ahab's sons. All of these would have had some kind of claim to the throne, and he kills them. 
Then he goes and he finds 42 of Ahaziah's sons. He was the king of the other kingdom. Had 42 of his sons killed. And then he went on to kill the rest of Ahab's family. The last part of his story is in the end of chapter 10. His last act was he wanted to wipe out the Baal worship from Israel in total, altogether. So he went to the temple of Baal and he talked to the priests. And all of this happened in a very short period of time, okay? The news didn't have time to cover it. There were no Facebook posts. He's doing this quickly before word could spread. Well, he goes in and he goes to the high priest of Baal and he says, we want to have the biggest festival to Baal ever. You thought Ahab worshiped Baal. No one's going to worship Baal like I do. But he was lying. He was lying. So they brought in all of the priests of Baal, everyone who served Baal in the whole nation. And they came together for this huge feast to Baal and they, they prepare a burnt offering. And once they're all in the place, Jehu rolls out, he looks to his commanders and he says, kill every one of them. And what we hear in the final verse, verse 28 of chapter 10 of his story says this, thus Jehu destroyed Baal from Israel. One man, obedient to God, empowered by God. God is giving him favor all along. When you have to do hard things and you obey God, God comes alongside you and he helps you. So God, using Jehu, goes through and Baal worship is destroyed from all of Israel. Jehu accomplishes what God had sent him out to do. I read this story. I don't know if you can relate, but it's kind of got a Godfather kind of tone to it. Okay, you do. You're, you're with me. You get it. Now, see, the Godfather is weird because the, the heroes of the story, and this isn't just for the Italians, but the heroes for the story are all criminals and murderers. And you watch it, and you find yourself rooting for the criminals and the murderers to take out the worst criminals and the worst murderers, right? And then you feel a little bit guilty because you're a Christian. You're like, oh, I can't root for murderers. Like, oh, but that was so cool. He killed all five heads of the family. And boom, okay. Well, Jehu, this is better because he was working for God, okay? We could actually root for this guy and not feel guilty because he was doing God's work. And through one man, Jehu wiped out Baal worship in all of Israel. This morning, men, I want to talk to you about walking in your calling and walking in the power and the authority of God. But this isn't just a physical battle. We're told in scripture, this is a spiritual battle. You don't get to bring out your crossbow and go shoot anybody, okay? Even though you might want to. Spiritual battle. A spiritual battle. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 tells us this. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Again, Paul reminds us in Ephesians 4, 12, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We are absolutely called to fight. We are absolutely in a battle. And we must fight like eternity depends on it. Because it does. Because it does. We fight like our family's eternity depends on it. Like our children's eternity, like our own eternity, depends on it, because it does. Because the battle that we are waging, the war that is being fought, is for your soul. Understand, the war has been decided. Jesus has won the victory. Jesus defeated the enemy at the cross Corinthians tells us that he made a public spectacle of the enemy when he was nailed to the cross. 
Jesus died and rose again, and he defeated Satan for once and for all. The war is over. We're going to win that. But the battle is for you. And the battle is for your soul. And our defeated enemy, whose destiny he knows is to be thrown in hell for eternity, wants to take you with him. And he wants to take your family with him. And he wants to take your children with him. And that's why we are called to fight. Fight like our eternity depended on it. So let's look at this guy, Jehu, and let's look at some lessons that we can learn from his life so that we men can be used mightily by God. First thing we're going to look at is this, and I would challenge you men, first thing, understand your role. Understand your role and what you've been designed to do. Jehu was called by God to go and wipe out Baal, and he did it. He went after it big time. Men, you are called in scripture. Your role is to be priest, provider, and protector. Priest, provider, and protector. This is what God has called you to. You might not even realize it. You might be finding out this morning. Oh, that sounds like a lot, Pastor. Talk to God about it. It's his word. He's called you to be priest. What does that mean? You hear the word priest. A lot of us, you probably don't have great, great mental pictures. Bible times, what did the priest do? The priest went before God for the people. Men were called to be priests specifically in our homes. In our homes. That we are the ones who are to, to bring our wives and our children before the Lord. We are called to this, to this holy role to set the spiritual atmosphere. In your home, yes. And also in your life. In, in, in your life and how you live. Because it's very hard to lead a home if you can't lead yourself, right? So it has to start right here. It starts personally. You have to be the man of God so you can lead others to serve God. How we live, more important than, than what we say. It's frustrating sometimes. Because men like this verse a little too much. <laughs> they, they like this verse a little bit too much because they, they want to be the ones to call all the shots and everything else, and, and I think sometimes the motives are, are messed up. But here's the thing, and, and guys, I think we know this. You can't live poorly and then expect someone to follow your leadership. You have to take care of business here first, right? We, we have to get our lives in line and then do our best to lead our wives, our families, our spouse. But you have to start by leading yourself. We're called priests to God. Boy, that's a whole sermon. We could look at the requirements for priests in the Old Testament. We, we could look at the priest and their service in the tabernacle when they would go into the holy of holies, the most holy place in the very back of the building, the place that only the high priest could go and he could only go one time a year. And he had to make sure that he was prepared to go into the presence of God. And they would tie a rope around the waist of the high priest, and they would have bells at the bottom of his robe, and they would listen to make sure that when he went in there, he wasn't struck dead because of his own sin. He had to make sure he was ready. I've thought about that many times, and you realize, even though the Bible doesn't tell us it happened, there was a reason they were tying ropes and wearing bells, right? It happened once. It's like the sign that's up in the restaurant that tells you, you know, <laughs> my favorite one is the, the, the little silver dot and it's on the glass pane next to the door. And it's reminding people there's a glass pane here and don't walk through it because it hits your face. When I, when I was young, I had a part-time job and I worked at a place and we didn't have that silver dot, and I watched a lady carrying all her food walk full speed into the glass, and I couldn't stop laughing. It was awful. It was terrible. I had to hide. I ducked behind the counter. It was great. I mean, it was terrible for her, but who'd, who'd have thought it'd show up in a sermon 30 years later? So 
these, these warnings were issued because somebody found out the hard way. They needed to be warned. Well, the priest would have to prepare himself because he knew if he walked in there with secret sin, if he went into the holy presence of God and he wasn't prepared, it was done. He was finished. The role of priests, God calls us priests. We're priests of our own household. We're also called providers. Yes, God calls us to work. I think we know that. New Testament says the man who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. King James throws infidel in there. That's nice. Work, be diligent, set a good example. Pay your taxes, pay your bills, provide for your family. That's all a good thing. But don't provide for your family at the expense of the rest of your role. Don't make the provision portion the only thing that you focus on. Because you could be so focused on provision, you could forget about the priest. You could forget about the protection. You could forget about being the man of God you're supposed to be because you're really just thinking about provision. But let's be honest, it's not about provision. It's about greed and it's about money. And it's about getting ahead. A lot of men have sacrificed their priesthood under the, the guise, oh, provision, I gotta provide for my family. It's not what you're doing because provision goes beyond money. There's spiritual provision. There, there's caring for other needs more than just finances many times. We're tempted, especially in our culture, to pursue that, that worldly success. And in doing so, we leave these other roles and responsibilities on the shelf. And we hurt ourselves. I've never spoken with anyone at their deathbed who said, I wish I made more money and worked harder. I've heard a lot of different things. I wish I served God more. I wish I spent more time with my kids. I wish I had a better relation. I've heard a lot. I've never heard one say, boy, I wish I spent more time working. Because sometimes we get hyper-focused on one thing and we miss what's more important. But yes, we're called to provide and we're called to be a protector. God forbid an intruder were to try and come into your home, or, or better yet, there was a church shooting in Alabama. It happened at, it was called a boomer's luncheon. So they were mostly older people at this luncheon. And a guy walked in, I just read about this. Was this this, this week, earlier this week? Guy walks in, sits by himself. They invite him, come sit with us. No, I'm fine. Sits by himself. At some point, he takes out a gun, shoots a couple people, two or three people. And this old man takes a chair, hits the guy with it, and then just beats the snot out of him and holds him down until the police come. Because in our role as protector, if something was to happen in our house, if something was to happen in our church, there would be men who would jump in to, to protect, to help, to, to, to be a part of the solution. Not every guy. Some wouldn't. Some would duck and hide. But in our role as protector, if someone was coming at your family, I don't care who you are, you'd be all over it. If they were coming after your kids, you'd be all over it. That role of protector, God just, it, he puts it in us as men. But if the only protection we're thinking about is when an intruder comes to our house and we're not thinking about the spiritual protection that we need to be providing for our families, we miss it because the enemy of our souls has been knocking at the door of our homes for years through social media, through TV, through the internet garbage that's pouring into our homes. In the public schools, our children are taught ideologies that stand in stark contrast to the word of God, from gender to race, even to creation. Men, you're called to be the protector of your family, not, not just against violent attacks, but against spiritual attacks. Called to set the standard, called to set the bar high, called to be aware of what's going on. This is our role. 
First thing we need to do, we need to understand our role. Second thing we need to do, men, need to understand your weapon. Jehu was skilled with the sword and with his bow. We must be skilled with our weapon. Ever fire a bow? A lot of fun. I think the last time I fired a bow was archery class in sixth grade. I got kicked out of class because apparently when loading your arrow, you shouldn't be talking to your friend. My fault, first time I didn't know. That was the last time I shot a bow as well. Not a hunter. Jehu was skilled with his bow as depicted in the, uh, in the story we shared earlier. But men, our weapon is different. Our weapon is the word of God. It's called the sword of the spirit. We need to perfect our skills with our weapon. Understand your weapon. We see Jehu and how he fought for God in the same way. Men, we're called to fight for our marriage, fight for our children, fight for your integrity, for your testimony. We fight for the Lord. But our weapon is the word of God. Hebrews calls it a two-edged sword. Jehu was skilled with his weapon. How are you with yours? You might be able to shoot a target 19 out of 20 times from from 25 yards, but what good is that when Satan's attacking your marriage? We need to be sharp with our skills with the word of God. The word of God has everything that we need in it for life and godliness. It is God's guidebook. He has preserved it for us through thousands of years so that we can have his word today more than ever in the West. We have no excuse. If you have a smartphone today, and most of you do, you have free access to hundreds of translations of the Bible. I don't like to read. Press a button and some dude reads it to you. There's so many ways for us to get into the word of God. I'll go to the driving range. And I'll gladly spend an hour trying to work on my weapon, my driver. I'll gladly spend an hour to straighten it out, work a little draw, a little cut. What are we doing with the word of God? How are we being skilled and trained in the word of God? Don't give me this, I come to church once a week. Not going to cut it. We need to be in the word. We need to be students of the word. We need to be studying the word. Most of all, we need to be applying the word and living the word and living it for our family, our wife and our children, living the word of God. And that applies for anyone here today, man or woman. What are we doing with our weapon? When the enemy comes in like a flood, your Zumba class isn't gonna repel him. We need to be in the word. We need to be in the word of God. Understand your role, understand your weapon. Third thing I would tell you to understand today, and men, this is for you, understand your calling. Understand your calling as a man of God. Jehu was called to wipe out idol worship from Israel. He fought. He fought to cleanse God's people from the idolatry that was so pervasive. Too often, men, we stand back. We stand down. We don't want to fight. Too many times in our homes, even in our marriages, even in our life, sometimes in our country, we prefer fake peace over a much-needed fight. Sometimes we surrender ground to the enemy under the guise of, well, peace. Sometimes we let our kids get away with stuff we shouldn't let them get away with because, eh, well, we don't want to make a big deal about it. We let things go in our marriage. We let things go in our family. But sometimes we're called to fight. Sometimes we're called to draw a line, to stand up. Jehu went ahead and he stood up for what the Lord was calling him to. And something amazing happens, and I mentioned it earlier. When you are obedient to God, God fights for you. He does. When you are taking the stand for God, whether it be in your own life, men and women, 
Men, whether it be in your family or with your children, when you are taking a stand for God, when you're taking a stand for righteousness, guess who's right beside you? Guess who's fighting alongside you? The King of kings and the Lord of lords. When we take a stand for him, he comes, he comes to our aid. And sometimes when we think about the problems and the battles and the things that we have to overcome, it's real easy to get overwhelmed. It's real easy to think, I can't do that. It's real easy to think, I'm not strong enough. And we're not. But with God, all things are possible. And when he's, he's by our side and when we're pursuing him and doing things his way, God stands with us. But we get in trouble when we just surrender we just quit, we give up, we don't embrace the Lord for help, and we just try to do things our own way. And this is the struggle of all of mankind, to go and do it God's way, to let God come alongside you, or in our pride and foolishness, we think we found a better way, so we'll do it ourselves. This was the original sin. This is what happens in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve thought they found a better way outside of God's plans and God's provision. And they said, no, God, we don't want to do it with you. We're going to try our own thing. And it was their downfall. That story is our story. That story is the story of every man, woman, and child in here. When we take our eyes off Jesus, we try to do it our own way. We get ourselves in trouble. Understand your calling. And I think God today is calling some of you to clean house. Some of you have let some things slide for too long in your own life. God's calling you on it. Some of you have let things go with your marriage and with your children, and you need to step up and you need to lead. God is calling us to that. Don't give up on your God given calling. Stop settling. Don't be distracted. Set the tone. Lead. Lead yourself. Lead your family. Lead your children. Lead in your church. Priest, provider, protector. One more thing to share as we wrap up this morning. I'll ask the worship team to come as we close. And it's the end of the story for Jehu. After he accomplished everything that God had called him to accomplish, we stumble on one more verse, and it's kind of a tragic ending. Second Kings chapter 10, verse 31 tells us this is the end of his story. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. He did some godly things. God used him. But he wasn't all in. He wasn't completely committed. Tuesday night when Brother Greg was here, he talked about finishing well. Not just starting well, not just coming out of the gate with a bunch of zeal, and, but ending well but finishing well. Bible tells us we're in a race, but I think we've realized it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a long race. It's a race we go through every day of our lives. And the goal for you and I isn't just to run. It's to finish. To finish well. Jehu didn't finish well. There, there was some stuff in his life that he just would not surrender to God even though God used him, even though he did some incredible things for the Lord, he didn't finish well. And believer, I don't want that to be your testimony. I don't want there to be the testimony of the season where you served God with all your heart, but you, in the end, you just weren't all in. You weren't fully committed to God and his ways. I say this often from this pulpit, you've heard me say it before, your best life, man, woman, young person, your best life is when God is the Lord of all of it. 
when you give every single part of who you are, your relationships, your calling, your plans, your goals, your future, your family, when you give it all to Jesus, that is the best future imaginable for your life. Because God's your creator. He designed you. He made you. He knows what's best for you. When you give yourself fully to him, it doesn't get any better for us than that right there. But that's where Jehu struggled. He did not walk in the law of God with all his heart. I want to encourage you this morning, men and, and everyone, don't hold back. Don't hold back on what God has for you. Don't hold back on what God has called you to. Let's embrace everything that our Heavenly Father has for us this morning. As we close today, there's three things that are just standing out with Jehu's story. The first was how God took him from such a bad place, such a bad history, such a bad track record. And God showed him grace and brought him to himself. That story of redemption. And that story of redemption, it's not just for him. It's for you and I this morning as well. No matter who you are, no matter how far away you are from God, no matter what you've done, it wasn't worse than Jehu, I promise you that. God brought him in and God could bring you in too. Second thing I'd remind you of, be who God has called you to be. Walk in the calling that God has for you. Men, women, young people. Be who God has called you to be. Not who someone else has called you to be. Not who society has called you to be. Not the pressures from the ungodly, but your maker, your creator, your father God. Be who he has called you to be. Do what he has called you to do. Live as he has called you to give, to live. And finish well. Finish strong. Give God all the glory with your life. We're going to close with a word of prayer this morning before the team plays the final song and I'll, I'll dismiss the service. But as we do, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor and men, I'm not going to ask you to walk up here because you'd hate me forever because, yeah, because you're men. But I will ask you to do this and the whole sanctuary, would you stand together with me? And if you're next to your husband, your father, your dad, you're around somebody, I want to pray over the men of our church right now. It's Father's Day. It's appropriate. Not to the exclusion of everyone else, but God has a calling on lives here, and it's important. And I know as a father, we need his help to be who he's called us to be through every season, to be consistent, to be stable. It's hard. Jesus, we need you. If you're around your dad, husband, whoever it is, put your arm around him. Grab his hand and let's just pray to God together. Heavenly Father, we need you. God, we need you desperately. And Lord, we know that you've called us to great things, that you have plans for us, but Jesus, we cannot do it without you. And Lord, in this world where it's so easy to be distracted, it's so easy to be sidetracked, God, I pray that you would open our eyes and help us to focus on what's most important. Lord, I pray for every man in this place today who feels disqualified, who feels too far away, he's done too much. Lord, let us just remember your redemptive love for us. And no matter how far we've strayed, God, you're always calling us back. Lord, I pray for the men in here today that they would understand their calling and their role and what you have called us to be and called us to do. And even when it's hard, God, that we would stay the course, that we would lean on you as our strength. Lord, I pray for everybody in this place today. God, help us to finish well. Lord, help us to finish well, to stay the course and to keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And God, I thank you for your love 
and your patience continue to work in us, continue to work in our hearts, continue to work in our lives. Heavenly Father, I lift up the men of our church this morning. And Lord, we pray your blessing on them as they live, as they love, as they lead, as you have called them to do. We thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's go ahead. Let's worship the Lord together as we close. And I'll come back and dismiss you in just a moment. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up. Until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so. Of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend In the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give. we have a heavenly father who loves us without end even when we're not at our best even when we we mess it up even when it's hard it's hard to be a dad hard to be a mom hard to live for him we have a god a heavenly father who loves us anyway through all of it aren't you glad that he loves us anyway aren't you glad he loves us even when we're not at our best what a great God we have. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Lord, I pray that we'd be challenged this morning from what we heard in your word, that you have called us, told us how to live. God, I pray that we would embrace that challenge, realizing that with God, all things are possible. Lord, 
strengthen us today. Father, I pray a special blessing upon all the fathers in this place today. And I thank you, God, our heavenly Father, for your unending love. Thank you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Have a great Sunday. God bless you, church. Happy Father's Day.